Hey guys, Dr. Gooden back with another structural kinesiology video. In today's video, we are going to talk about the bony landmarks of the elbow and the radial ulnar joints. Okay, here we are in the elbow and radial ulnar joint slides. This comes, remember, from the Manual of Structural Kinesiology by R.T. Floyd. It's a great textbook, and these slides have been adapted by myself. Now, some important background before we get into the bony landmarks of the elbow and radial ulnar joints. First of all, these joints are involved in most upper extremity movements. Just about any time you move your shoulder or your shoulder girdle to accompany that movement, you are doing it in order to position your hand to manipulate something in space or something in front of you, whether it's in sports, dribbling a basketball, or shooting a basketball, catching a baseball, whether it's on your phone, texting, or you're driving or you're eating. Just about every upper extremity movement utilizes both of these joints. However, we can distinguish between movements of the elbow and radial ulnar joints. So they can, those movements can be distinguished from each other. And we can also distinguish between radial ulnar joint movements and those movements of the wrist. And we're going to talk about the wrist in a couple videos down the road, but just know that anything we do with our hand, I just did some kind of a weird motion there, I was trying to move at the wrist and elbow and radial ulnar joint simultaneously. Any joint movements that we do in the upper extremity are a combination of multiple movements from multiple joints. Now to go over the bones, uh, we have our humerus and then our ulna and radius here in the forearm. Now the ulna is much larger than the radius. The ulna is going to be on this pinky side and it starts larger up here and it gets smaller as it goes distal. The radius on the other hand is smaller approximately and larger distally. And they have those shapes because when you pronate or supinate at the radial ulnar joint, it allows, that's part of one of the reasons that it allows those bones to sort of rotate over each other as you go back and forth between pronation and supination. Also, it's important to note that the scapula and humerus serve as proximal attachments for muscles that flex and extend the elbow. So that makes sense, right? If you have a muscle that's going to control movement at the elbow, it's going to have to cross the elbow. And so the muscles will need to originate somewhere higher up the kinetic chain, uh, namely on the humerus or on the scapula. So our flexors or our extenders of the elbow will originate there. And then the radius and, and ulna serve as the distal attachments for those same muscles. So the muscles start proximal to the elbow joint and they end distal to the elbow joint, those muscles that flex and extend the elbow. That makes sense. For muscles that move the radial ulnar joint, it's both the scapula and humerus as well as the ulna that serve as proximal attachments, while the uh, distal attachment will be on the radius for all of those muscles. The primary movements of the radial ulnar joint, which we'll get into later, are pronation and supination. Now the bony landmarks would be the medial condyloid ridge, which you can actually find above the medial epicondyle, running up there. Here's the medial epicondyle and the olecranon process, as well as the coronoid process. That one's gonna to be tough to palpate. It's going, it will be underneath the, um, the sort of fleshy flexor wad <laughs> where those muscles originate. And then the radial tuberosity, which we will not palpate, but that is where the um, biceps brachii will insert. Now some more key bony landmarks, the medial epicondyle, which we already mentioned, but the lateral epicondyle on the other side, and then the lateral supracondylar ridge running up above that. Okay, and those are super easy to palpate. Um, on most people, if you find the electronaut process and then you go medial and lateral, as well as uh, um, proximal to that point, you can find the most lateral and the most medial bony points uh, right uh, right in line with the axis of rotation of your elbow. Now the elbow is a hinge type joint, 
So uh, it only allows flexion or extension. Flexion where you decrease the angle between the humerus and the radius and ulna, or extension where you increase that angle. Uh, but really there are two interrelated joints because you have a humerus, one bone, but then you have a radius and ulna, two bones, and it's interacting with both of them or, or articulating with both. So we, we really have the humeral ulnar joint and the radiohumeral joints. Now that said, even though I said that there were two joints at play because of the three bones, um, elbow, elbow movements primarily involve movement between the humerus and the ulna. Remember that we said that uh, proximally the ulna is going to be greater than the radius, it'll be larger. So most of that articular surface is, um, is on the ulna, between the, uh, the ulna and the humerus. And the specific structure will be the trochlea fitting into the ulnar trochlear notch. The radial head has a relatively small amount of contact with the capitulum of the humerus. Now, as the elbow reaches full extension, it's that olecranon process that will be received by the olecranon fossa, and that's part of what gives your elbow really good joint stability when it's fully extended. So, um, as an example, if you've ever um, lifted weights before and you're doing some so sort of overhead pressing movement, you know that if you lock the weight out, and you fully extend your elbow, it's much easier to hold it over your, your head. Uh, first of all, it's because the weight, the load will be stacked on your skeleton and held in place less by your musculature. Uh, but second of all, because of that increased uh, stability given to you by the olecranon process fitting into the olecranon fossa. If you guys have seen that movie, um, what's it called? It has a runner. Louis Zamperini and uh, Unbroken. If you've seen Unbroken, I read the book, great book, but if you see the movie, at the end he's having to hold this thing above his head um, because the you know evil uh, warden is, is making him do it and he's holding it above his head and he, and he goes forever, but he's holding it right here. And I kept thinking during the movie, I was like, Louis, if you just lock out your elbows, you're gonna be able to hold that thing for days. Um, you know, but he was in like a prisoner of war camp, so. I can't blame him for forgetting about his structural anatomy. Now, as the elbow unlocks from that extended position, about 20 degrees or more, we do increase the laxity um, of side-to-side -side motion. So as the elbow flexes to 20 degrees, we have more side-to-side -side laxity. And in this case, stability during flexion is more dependent on two ligaments in particular, the lateral collateral and the medial collateral ligaments, or more commonly known as the radial collateral ligament and the ulnar collateral ligament. Now, the most famous of the two, unfortunately, is the ulnar collateral ligament, and this is because uh, we hear oftentimes of professional baseball players, but now even college players and youth players who are tearing their UCL from overuse or from some sort of, or maybe they blow it out on a pitch, um, but usually it's due to overuse, too many uh, pitching too many innings, uh, throw, throwing too many fastballs, etc. We can see the picture over here of this UCL. There's, there's actually three sort of bundles that it's made up of. The posterior, intermediate, and anterior bundles. It, now this, as you can tell, because this is on the medial aspect of the elbow, it's critical in providing medial support to prevent the elbow from abducting. Now, this abduction prevention of the elbow when it's flexed is particularly crucial in high-velocity sporting activity. So really anything where you're throwing a ball overhead, also slightly to a lesser extent, but also maybe an overhead serving as well. Really just overhead athletes um, need to take care of their UCL. But the structure is often compromised, and so then we have that Tommy John surgery, which is a surgical reconstruction using a tendon graft from your palmaris longus. Fun fact, uh, not everybody has a palmaris longus, but you can tell, you can't see it through my Fitbit, you can tell if you do have one or not by touching your pinky and thumb together and then flexing your wrist. And if a tendon pops up, then that's your palmaris longus tendon. So go ahead and check if you have it. If you don't and you blow out your UCL, you gotta find something else. Now the radial collateral ligament is rarely injured, it provides lateral stability. 
Um, you know, I can see maybe though a tennis player who relies on a backhand, maybe uh, damaging that ligament. And then we also have the annular ligament that provides a sling-like effect around the radial head for stability. And you can see it right here. Now there's something that's called the carrying angle of the elbow. And the carrying angle, um, it's kind of, it's almost similar to the Q angle of the knees and the hips. We'll learn about that later. But the carrying angle just refers to the fact that in anatomical position, with your hands at your side, I would need to adduct a little bit more to get there. There is um, uh, a slight angle in your elbow. So the forearm actually deviates out about five to 15 degrees uh, laterally. So deviate laterally from the arm five to 15 degrees. It's slightly greater in the dominant limb usually than in the non-dominant limb. And females tend to have a greater carrying angle. Now it's called a carrying angle um, because when you carry something heavy, you can oftentimes put your elbow kind of towards your side and gain some stability that way. And then the load is sitting right there in the crook of your elbow. And if you've ever tried to carry a child for a long period of time, then you know what I'm talking about. If you can get that child in tight and sort of on your hips and allow your axial skeleton to bear that load instead of carrying them off to the side, so much better. Um, You'll know the carrying angle well if you take a small kid to Disneyland and they ask to be held for the whole day. Okay, so now the radial ulnar joint. This is a pivot type joint. Remember I mentioned that the bones, the two bones, the radius and the ulna kind of pivot around each other when you go through supination and pronation. Specifically, the radial head rotates around at the proximal ulna. And the distal radius rotates around the distal ulna. You can see in this picture here, the radial notch of the ulna right here, receiving the head of the radius. And it's that feature that allows the radius to complete that rotation back and forth. Also in the middle, notice that we have this webbing. This is the interosseous membrane that binds the radius and ulna together. It keeps them clamped together. So even when they're moving back and forth, rolling over each other, um, they stay tight. It's kind of like tightly woven um, saran wrap that's bound around these two bones. It keeps them together even as the radius uh, rotates around the ulna. Now, as I mentioned, that joint is held tightly by the interosseous membrane which is technically called syndesmosis. And this is what allows for that substantial rotary motion between the bones. Okay, so that's the background and bony landmarks for the elbow and radial ulnar joints. Okay, thanks for joining me, Dr. Gooden, professor of kinesiology and sports scientist. If you wanna continue learning about this region, check out the joint movements over here in this video, joint movements of the elbow and radial ulnar joint, if you want to follow along with the entire playlist, go ahead and head over here to the Structural Kinesiology playlist where you can keep track of all of the videos in this series to help you pass Structural Kinesiology or Anatomy. And thanks for watching.